All right, hi everyone, thank you so much. And actually, awesome introduction. Thank you for saying that. It's, uh, it's actually really refreshing and, and fun to see companies and teams come together like this. And Centrally Human is a company that actually is about Centrally Human. And the reality is this, this is what we're sitting with and looking at. So let's just lean in and get comfortable. So thank you so much for that. And I'm, I'm so honored to be here with you today. It is a gorgeous day. And we also have a warehouse cleaning checklist. So before you leave, I'm sure they're gonna reorg and, and put everyone to work in the, in the warehouse. Um, so my name is Kim and I'm gonna be really mindful of your time, but we're gonna walk through something that I call unleashing growth through inclusion and innovation. How many people here uh, are familiar with magazines? Like the, like a magazine, like paper. You got a couple, a handful, all right. I teach a class at a university with, with uh, 20 year olds and I asked that question and they were like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. So, uh, <laughs> so back in the early 2000s, and you'll apologize, I'm still getting used to doing this with a mask on. Is that all right? Okay. Oh. Now I might have food in my teeth, I didn't even check. Um, so thank you everyone for being here. It's really nice to see you. So back in the early 2000s, I was working at a publishing house in New York called Condé Nast. Uh, it is where they filmed The Devil Wears Prada. Uh, and so I worked with Self Magazine. It was a women's fitness magazine. And I remember there was this website called Pop Sugar. I don't know if anyone knows of it. You, like a couple people might know it. And it was this really interesting website where the people that wrote for it weren't weren't real journalists or writers, they were just people. And then they had a huge comment section where you could write back and there was like comment boards. And I was working with the editor in chief and I said, you know, I think this is gonna be a thing. We're like, we're gonna write things and then people are gonna write back. And at the time we were trying to figure out how many pictures to put in the article that we were copy and pasting onto the internet, right? Cause you'd print it in the magazine, you copy and paste the text, you'd put it on the internet, you'd take the same picture and so we started having these conversations about, oh, you could use two pictures because it's the internet, you know, and how far we've come. So that was early 2000s, this idea of the internet not even having a conversation on it. And that magazines that were the, the, the bread and butter of the content that we received were still having challenges realizing that you could put two pictures on the internet, just not one picture like you printed in the magazine. In the year 2006, or seven, YouTube was created. It was acquired by Google with like one video, but it was the first time that you could load a video to the internet. So it hasn't been that long. There was a time not too long ago where you couldn't put a video on the internet. Around that same time, a smartphone was created, but really before then you couldn't even record a video. So I could see how a lot of people were like, cool, you could put a video on the internet, but I have to take my camera and hook up the USB and do all this uploading, and it was still a dial-up connection. And that was the year 2006. So at that time, I was actually working in digital marketing. I loved websites, I loved web development, I loved connecting with people. And so I started working at a big marketing company with Google and this thing called YouTube, and Facebook was still login only with, you know, you had to have a, an EDU uh, email address. And we thought, that this was going to change the world because we were going to be more connected than ever before. My husband deployed to Iraq, smartphones didn't exist. He comes home, it's the iPhone 2. And he's like, I don't know, man, this internet on a phone thing, it's gonna be a thing. It didn't work. The world is not more connected to each other than ever before. Statistically, we actually feel farther apart. Incredible innovations in growth, but it didn't create the kind of human connection that we thought. We don't feel more connected to our customers all the time. We don't have this euphoria of being, feeling like you're right next to your, your, your partner or your friend or you know everything about someone. We feel farther apart and that's okay. That was supposed to happen. So what I call what happened is the digital first era you know, we had smartphones with applications on them. I don't, no one knew why they needed an app, so we all just built apps, right? You're like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this, but I'm gonna get it and I'm gonna download it and we're gonna figure out what I'm supposed to do with this on my phone. And we were supposed to do that. It was digital first. It was digital for the sake of digital because it was so new and so fast. You were buying phones, multiple phones. We didn't even know what we needed them for. 
computers and laptops and tablets. How many households have more than two tablets in their household? Right? I think I've got like four. I don't even know where they come from. Right? With different jobs, you're just getting tablets everywhere. And that was fine. Right? I remember working with a car company and they made a different website for every single version of car. Why? Nobody knows. They just thought maybe we should have a lot of websites. Did that help them with their customer connectivity? No. Because within all those websites, everyone feels disconnected to the bigger brand. Within all those you know, smartphones and tablets, we're sitting there looking at things and we're getting distracted and missing each other. And companies are so worried about their website that they're forgetting about their customers. So it was the digital first era, and that started changing. Sometime around the year 2015, we start to see a shift. I call it the human-centric shift. It's a shift where there became a global collective acknowledgement that we're tired of digital. We're tired of this not working. We don't want to get rid of it. It's fine. That's all right. We don't want to get rid of it, but it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. And there's three big traits of the, of the human-centric era. Simplicity, authenticity, and radical transparency. I'm not going to go through all of those today. That's a whole other program and talk. But you all can acknowledge that you feel it. We have a desire for people to tell us the truth. Corporations, back in like the year 2016, I want to say, only like 20% of corporations reported sustainability efforts to Wall Street. Now over 90% do. Does that connect to their product line? No. Does that connect to their profitability metrics? No. Do people care how they're treating the environment and what they're doing to give back? Yes. That's an example of the human-centric shift. It's the way that we treat each other. You know, I think back to the 1990s, that Coca-Cola commercial. I remember, like, Coke's going to bring the world together. Do you remember that? And, like, the end of the Mad Men series where it's like, oh, daisies. And, and what happened with the Pepsi commercial? Is Pepsi really going to break up a Black Lives Matter protest? And all the cops are going to go, oh, you gave me a can of pop. All right, protest over, everything's done. No, there was incredible backlash. It worked in the 90s. It doesn't work anymore because you are a soft drink and that doesn't make any sense, <laughs> right? It's not intuitive. It's not transparent. It's not authentic. And it's not just the way that we expect each other to treat each other. It's the way we expect people to treat businesses. So here's, here's the twist. Not only is it global and multi-generational because every single one of you and every customer around the world has this drive. We're seeing it in social media movements. We're seeing it at the way companies are changing their transparency with employees. We're seeing it in the way that people are demanding transparency in governments and data. And we're seeing the way that people want to know about the companies that they work for and work with. So that's hard, right? How do you take a human-centric era with you and me going, you know what, let's go out for a drink. Let's use social media, right, to connect on Facebook or Instagram, but then we're going to go experience it together. And it's that experiential movement of friends that you want to post on social media, that you showed up in person. Well, we want that from corporations too. Your business partners want that. So how do you take a business and make it human? This is the challenge. This is where if you hear any companies having a hard time resonating, it's because a corporation is in its core a non-human entity. It is a legal entity. A corporation, an LLC, that's not human. It was never designed to be human. But it has to be. You can see the way people treat corporations and they have human expectations on them. And that's hard for businesses to manage. And what's interesting, it's your industry too. It's not clothing and makeup and all these, it's manufacturing. Like this is happening across industries and it's been happening for a while. So your business partners have started holding you to a different expectation. Customer service is more important now than ever, right? The way that they're discovering you online, how they wanna see you as employees, your faces. If you have disgruntled employees, that's gonna factor into someone's psychological decision on doing business. And so the human-centric era is really powerful because it's not going away anytime soon. If anything, we're finding it being bolstered in the year 2020. But it comes off of this very digital first era where we had all these technologies and tools 
for the sake of the technologies and tools, but now we forgot about the people. <laughs> so now we're coming back and going, ah, yes, humans, we're still part of this. We still need to do this work. How do we use all this stuff that we have to connect with each other? Because we lost it and we're desperate for it now more than ever. So we think about company growth in this human-centric era. And the reality is, and I'm, I'm happy to be challenged on this, we're probably not going to have another version of the iPhone created in the next 10 years. All right, the smartwatch is an iteration on the smartphone. Twitter is an iteration on the Facebook newsfeed. Right, there's really not, all the innovations in this room are probably iterated off of a, a previous product. Medical device technology and sales, right? It's just people kind of iterating on other things. We're not gonna see a really net new creation. Even the spacesuits that they're sending into space, they didn't create spacesuits, they just modified the design of a 1960 spacesuit. So for the next 10 years, when you're thinking about what the world's look like and how we're gonna grow, it's not going to be on any big new innovation that we haven't seen yet. It's going to be iterative ideas that humans are creating themselves. So you all as individuals, and what we're seeing at most corporations is that it's iterative innovations that are small changes that are actually going to coalesce and create massive changes or new business opportunities and organizations. And what's amazing about this is that human beings are designed by nature to be innovators. We are intrinsically innovative. Human beings are a species that has literally evolved based on our ability to create and innovate out of nothing. Human beings have built this world out of nothing, out of our minds, out of thoughts that we have that we turned into reality. We are designed to create. We are innovating machines. Do we like change? No. Is it uncomfortable? 100%. But are we designed to do it? Yes. That is literally, if you want to break down humanity in its biggest form, it's like, wow, challenge, did something different, figured something out, created something new, in, you know, innovated on something that's hard. So what's interesting about when we think about this human-centric era and the need for growth in ways that are going to be just a new piece of technology it lives in human beings. And what's amazing is that humans want to do it. We want to lean into that work because we've been starved of it for the last 10 years. And conveniently, we're made to do that. Our imaginations are endless. That is, an, that is a phenomenal resource. You can imagine anything that you want and there is no resource constraint on that at all. It's boundless. So when we think about innovation, and my definition of innovation is your imagination with constraints. And that's when it gets fun. Because your imagination has no limit, but life does. And that's when an imagination or creative idea or wish turns into an innovation. Because you don't have all the people, you don't have all the time, you don't have all the money, and you don't have the right resources. Game on. Now you're talking about innovation. So Centrally Human developed something called an innovation matrix because what we found is a lot of organizations created an innovation team. Well, this team over here is going to innovate and they're going to be our growth team and then these guys are going to keep the wheels on the bus and they're going to be our kind of keep the core business going team, right? Totally makes sense. The challenge is I can't make you not use your imagination. You're designed to use it. You use it all the time. And when we create that other, we start believing that there's only one kind of innovation. Yes, that innovation team is being very thoughtful. That's a very specific kind of innovation, absolutely valid. But in this matrix, there's all kinds of innovation. There's net new, like the iPhone, right? Or like the space shuttle. There's, you know, you know expansive and a new development on something different that has wide-ranging impacts. So I don't know anyone here like the idea of waterfall design. Microsoft did a lot of waterfall design. It's a very linear process or like the factory line you, versus, agile. versus agile versus coming back and iterating and checking in periodically. You're still getting from the beginning to the end. It's just a different cadence. 
that has had a global impact. So the smartwatch is a smartphone on your wrist, and the wristwatch was already there. So that's taking two ideas and combining it into a net new, right? There's not, and, and I, I'm not putting anyone down, but there's probably not many people here that have the resources, the time, the capabilities to design something that groundbreaking. Not that it's impossible, it's just a big ask. And if we wait on companies to grow looking for that, we're not going to see a lot of growth. We don't have time. You all have families. You want to make money. There's nothing wrong with making money as part of a business mission, right? That's what drives us to go home and live in this amazing world. Buy more masks, you know, all the extra stuff that we can do now. Turn your room into a Hawaii vacation because you can't go to the beach. <laughs> Just buy a lot of sand and, you know, make your own beach. So there's this area of it called iterative innovation. And this is where it gets great for individuals to innovate into. Iterative innovation is the idea that if you spend time thinking about a way to optimize an Excel spreadsheet, right? How many people end up working in Excel on a day-to-day -day basis? A handful, right? And you say five minutes. If you're not an innovator, you'll do that and you'll say, yeah, say five minutes and you'll go on with your day. If you're an innovator, you'll say that, you'll, you'll do that, and you'll say, God, if I share this with people, then they can say five minutes. Five minutes across an organization is money, right? His time is money. And all that time freed up collectively can give you time to think, spend more time on something else. I mean, when you, those are the small iterative innovations that we do every single day because that's what you're programmed to do. The challenge is if it's an iterative innovation, most people don't celebrate them, they don't share them, and they don't listen to others when they contribute them. But that's where we're gonna see companies grow. That's the disruption that's going to be a differentiator in a lot of industries, is individuals, the human beings on the team that are critically important, identifying as innovators and sharing their innovations to drive growth saving time, saving money, changing your attitude. If you figured out a better way to get to work, share it with someone. Not because it's a nice thing to do, but because it's the right thing to do, because that's an innovation. When it scales, it scales and it's powerful. And we can control that. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is close your eyes for a minute and think about yourself today in your title engineer, data analyst, social media marketer. I'm naming the people in front of me that I got to talk to. <laughs> and think about your colleagues and the people that moved this company, the truck driver that I waved to when I came in outside, the people that worked the warehouse, WNHR. Think about yourself and your title. Now add the word innovator to it. Keep your eyes closed. You are what you do and you are an innovator. You have an internal system that you probably have your title and a job description. Into your job description, you could add innovator. On your social media profile, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you use, you can add the word innovator into your personal description. On your LinkedIn profile, add the word innovator in your headline. When you talk to each other in meetings and you say who you are when you're talking to a client, you're part of the innovation team. You're a project manager and innovator. Go ahead and open your eyes. The only thing that changed is your identity and ownership of being an innovator. And this is really critical because inclusive innovation means that you all have the right and the duty now as innovators to make sure everybody's at the table and heard and that you're listening because you're innovators now. It doesn't matter how small or iterative 
and it doesn't matter how big and unwieldy. That's not your job to say no. Your job as an innovator is to say, let's put that down and think about it. Say that again for me. That's interesting. What if we thought about it this way? You know, so-and-so has been at the table and I haven't heard them speak. Are we giving them space to speak and share? Because they have ideas that I want to hear, even if it's small. It changes the way that you go home when you talk to your family and your friends. And I'm not asking you to come up with ideas. You think about them all the time. That's the best part of this. You're doing it every single day. All I'm asking you to do is own it and change your identity. Someone who believes they're not an innovator keeps it inside. Innovators share and listen. Because that's the other side of this. If you're a manager, if you're a people leader, if you're a colleague that's in a position of influence, it's saying to the person, say that again. I haven't heard from you in a while. How are things going? Any ideas? Like, what have you been doing in your day? How have you figured things out? What's, what are you doing that's fun and different that you've been testing out? And it's listening and saying, yeah, I don't know how that would work, but let's put that down. Let's put that out somewhere and let's think about it. Maybe we could work that into another project. Now, I will caveat and say innovation doesn't mean you're going to do everything for everyone and have this massive list and go to your managers and say, OK, here are all my innovation ideas. You're welcome. And when they say no, you say, well, they don't listen to me. <laughs> this is not an innovative company. No, innovation is coming up with ideas within constraints. So if you have an innovative idea and your manager comes back and says, we don't have money for that, you say, cool, I'm going to figure out how to do this for free. That's innovation. Innovation is ideas with constraints. And yes, there's business planning, right? What's going to have the most impact for the business? Because you don't have all the time in the world. So then you say, what do you think is really going to move this? I think this can scale. I think this is a little thing, but if we got everyone to do it, it could really scale. Cool. Let's make a little business plan for that. How would that work? Are we thinking about all the constraints? What's going on in those people's lives that would help them or hurt them in adopting it? Right? Then you go into a business planning mode. But innovation is realizing that your ideas are possible and they're even more powerful when you factor in the constraints and you share them and you receive them. So we're going to take a minute because you all have chalk. It's COVID sanitized chalk, don't worry. And I know that you're in a lot of these thought processes right now, personally, professionally, in your development stages. Think about either an idea that you had that you want to share on the floor or something that you're working on right now that you didn't think was worth sharing before or a goal that you have for your career that you thought was something that wasn't a big deal. So take your piece of chalk, think about an idea that you had personally or professionally that you've either done that you would now call innovative that you think you would love to consider that's on your development plan or your goals for next year and write it down. If you're really, really smart and you memorize where everyone's sitting, then I guess you could identify whose it is. But the idea is that you can walk around afterwards as you're talking to each other and look and say, that's a good idea. And it's a little bit uncomfortable, but it's your job now because you're innovators. So it's OK to go outside your comfort zone and share a small idea, something that either affects you, someone else, no one at all. So go ahead and take a few minutes, write it down, and then we'll come back and, and wrap it up. But I'll give you a little bit of time something that you're excited to do, an innovative idea, or something that you, that you wouldn't have shared before that you want to put on the floor. So one of them was create an information sharing process. And I, I actually really like that one a lot because it's not even too specific, right? It's not with a certain program or if it has to be online or offline, right? It's just a process. And sharing that out sparks other people to say, oh, I didn't even know that's what you were thinking about. I have a couple ideas. How can we figure out how to get that done? Even if it's throughout the days, right? This is something that, again, as innovators, it's your right duty and obligation to do this every day. As humans of this company and as, as employees. You know, when you go to market, how powerful for you to say, I'm an innovator at this company. And we're thinking about even the littlest thing for you, from how to help our employees park smarter so they can get in during a rainy day, 
to how to make sure we're starting our day well by sharing innovative ways to start the morning to creating really efficient modern day intercompany websites. Because if you use what the companies in the 1990s did, ugh, right? But you have the opportunity to hop skip over your competition and actually build things for purpose that meet your custom needs. Because that's what your customers want from you and that's what you can do with each other. That's the human centric era. It's being simple, transparent, authentic, the ability to innovate is natively in each of you as a human being. As an evolutionary default, we are made for this. And you are in an organization that has brought me in and shows the investment in this. And they need you and want you. And even a small idea is critical to share. And listen to. Because the truck driver who says, hey, it takes me an extra 20 minutes to pull in, you're like, nah. Okay, as an innovator, you say, noted, sir. I'm not gonna forget about that. And you mention it to people and you socialize it because that man's important or woman is important. That 20 minutes is important. Those are little ideas that can change things in ways that you don't even know. And to the point made earlier, we don't know what the next 10 years will look like. But if you bring up that little idea, you don't know the possibilities of what it can be because none of you are mind readers and none of us can see the future. And so putting down your idea before you even vocalize it and give it credit doesn't make sense. Put it out there, listen to each other, give space to each other to bring their whole selves to work and bring ideas because it's your right and responsibility as innovators. The work you do is really important because you're part of this community, part of my community. I really appreciate being with you, with you here today. And the world's ready for your ideas. And now you're innovators. So welcome to the human-centric world. Thank you. Thanks. Kim Brown joined us as our guest speaker at the employee meeting today. She did an awesome job. Um, what she covered for us was employee engagement, which covered inclusiveness and also innovation and really shared with us that everybody has the right to share their ideas. And then when ideas are presented, we should also listen to those ideas to um, help our company grow and expand. It was really great, very, she's very personable, shared great information and answered everybody's questions and she's sticking around for some answers, questions and answers now too. Thank you.